Welcome to this next video uh, for William Golding's Lord of the Flies and in this video we'll be looking at chapter 6 of the novel and studying three and thinking about three really significant questions. Firstly, how is the island being used as a symbolic framework and what are some of the meanings that come from that? Secondly, what does this novel say about leadership and the nature of leadership and how leaders should and shouldn't behave? And finally, to what extent is the world of this novel becoming increasingly barbaric? We'll look at two passages from the start and the end of the chapter and we will then track and trace those ideas across the novel before we finally come back at the end of the video to thinking about our overall answers to those three questions. Okay, in front of us then we have the first passage from chapter 6 uh, from Golding's Lord of the Flies, Beast from Air. At the start of the chapter we've seen uh, the parachutist land and we'll come and we'll look at that later and we'll particularly look at the symbolism of that in the next chapter, in the next video. But here we're looking at uh, the other end of the island and this place for a fort and we have this really vivid description of the island and the island setting. Um, so we are seeing this uh, through Ralph's point of view and this end of the island he is described as being surrounded by chasms of empty air. It's as though this island is vast and cavernous. There is a huge overwhelming quality to it. And when we think about the island as a presence that reflects the boys themselves, it's almost as though the island itself is becoming this increasing threat. Um, and indeed, Golden goes on to comment on the power of nature and the natural world, as we started to see in some of these earlier videos and looked at in some of our earlier videos in this series. Um, because we see that the sea would make an island of the castle, that we have the surrounding ocean is a natural force, that it works over time and then it has significant power. That then leads into the next stage of this passage because we go from the sea to the lagoon that we've seen, this calm lagoon um, on the island again and again, and that the island offers shelter and protection. And it makes it's ironic that the boys would seek to damage the island. Um, and there is therefore this sense that the island could have been idyllic, a perfect place, or even Edenic like the Garden of Eden, but actually the presence of humanity spoils and ruins this. In this next stage of the chapter, we have the this area personified. And it runs right through this section. We have the swell, so the ocean the ocean the ocean's changing levels. We have it breathing and whispering to begin with. So we begin calm and sedate. And if we think back to other descriptions in the novel, uh, this reminds me of the fire that started off small and calm and grew in strength and power and size. It's a reminder of the calmness that exists superficially. But then in the second half of this description, we see that the waters actually um, suck down and it boiled and it roars. So these are far more threatening, angry and dangerous. So if we take that even further, it's as though the strength of the ocean and nature 
is occasionally revealed. And there's one more element to look here because this part of the island of the ocean is described as a sleeping leviathan. So leviathans are ancient, uh, are creatures from myth and legend. So it's the mythologized power of nature that the boys struggle in the face of this power and they are overwhelmed by it. So as we continue through this passage, we also then see the boys' reactions to it and the re react their reactions to the space that surrounds it. Ralph is interesting because he, despite Jack's presence and, and his excitement, he says nothing. So there is this silence from the leader. Perhaps a disappointment. Perhaps a recognition of the futility of being on this island. And that is in opposition. We have Jack, sorry, in opposition to Ralph. He's excited. He sees it as a fort. And when we're thinking about this as a fort, it's as though it's the childlike play returns for a moment. It's this space to defend, but also forts are a military installation. So the boys move from innocence to being tainted. And indeed, there the Ralph recognises that. He challenges about the lack of fresh water here. And he goes on to say very bluntly that this is a rotten place. So this space is somehow dangerous. And indeed that word rotten, it could reflect and symbolize the rotten core at the heart of humanity. Particularly if we consider the idea we established in the previous video, in the previous big question, that the island has become a reflection of the nature of the boys. Okay, so having studied the end of chapter six and this place that Jack believes could be a fort where we saw the power of the island of the natural world and perhaps the threat, but also considering the symbolism if we think about the fact the island is becoming a reflection of the darkness inherent inside all the boys and humanity, we have this section and this opening. Um, now, the openings of these chapters are worth studying and coming back to because each opening of each chapter gives a vivid description of an element or part of the island as though it's a context for the rest of the chapter. But here we have a description at night time as the boys are starting to sleep. Um, we have darkness first. There was no light left. We have that darkness first that there's no light, there's no hope left. So it's as though guidance is becoming exhausted. And then Golding focuses on just the stars. Now, those are perhaps hopeful, but also stars are distant. The hope is distant that humanity is distant and unreachable. And this all plays and serves 
that sense of isolation, that the boys are cut off from the rest of the world. Now, we have that established isolation at this point, but Golding offers us a contrast to that as we come into this section. So we have the parachutist land in this moment of the novel at the chart of chapter, chapter six, and we get a sign from the world of the grown-ups. Now, it's defined, okay, in childish terms. as though there is a distinction between the worlds. And that's just a superficial covering because Golding really shows us that the boys are able to exhibit just the same levels of evil as the adult as adults are. But the important point is that in this world, this distant, this, this unreachable world of the adults, there is still war and conflict going on because we have a sudden bright explosion and a corkscrew's trail across the sky. So war is still carrying on. And it's referred to briefly in the opening of the novel. So this war is still carrying on. There is this ongoing violence in the world. And the boys, even on their island, um, they are still part of that same world. So it's inevitable that the boys join in and they fall to violence themselves. But we still see that across the sky, fire and damage briefly flash. So it's a reminder of that again. Um, the fact that there's this corkscrew tail, it's this uncontrolled explosion, and it's a su it's sudden and it's bright. Uh, reinforce that too. We have underneath that then the uh, the parachute just introduced for the first time. The same figure that will be mistaken by the boys for the be for the beast a little bit later. We have this figure dropping swiftly, uh, with dangling limbs. So in the same way as that explosion is uncontrolled so is the parachutist so we have the, we have this uncontrolled figure it's almost as though it's hanging in the air um, it's dropping swiftly so we have this figure falling so this violence simply results in death and suffering and that's what's being suggested here now, in the first video, the first, sorry, the first extract that we looked at for this video, we saw the power of nature and we have this once again. Because here, the figure is grabbed by the breeze and the breeze hauls the figure. So, nature and the natural world animate and move the corpse of the parachutist of the pilot and it's that na it's nature having that control actually it's more powerful than humanity itself um, and nature in the natural world take that over take that figure over oops uh, nature causes the corpse to appear to be the beast so that monstrousness is animated by nature. So again, the world at large reflects the darkness of humanity at a symbolic level. And Golden goes to great pains here to minutely and precisely explain how the figure of the parachutist is seen to move and move about. So the it's almost as though this dead parachutist is held in stasis. The body is stuck. It's prevented from moving on. It's held like a puppet. There is some sense of the island 
being like purgatory. As though the boys are in a sort of limbo, a middle space for transition. So this is giving us the sense that the island is in fact a liminal space, an in-between space. So liminal means in-between. And liminal spaces are where transformations and change happen. There is, of course, the fact that these boys are teenagers, so they are going through the movement from childhood to being adults. And again, you know, adolescence is a liminal space, it's an in-between time. We have this movement from innocence to evil and being exposed to darkness. So we have the increasing sense that this island is this purgatorial space, this in-between space, a liminal space. Um, and we have the, the kind of dark, um, grim imagery of the... Uh, pilot being pulled and lifted um, as though its head then sinks between its knees almost as though in some kind of prayer as well it but it bows down and it bows again it's as though it's in some it's it's as though it has been completely overpowered and overwhelmed and then Immediately after that, having established this sense of the island being a more liminal space, an in-between space, we then have this sent, this image here, this critical image of the signal fire having been allowed to go out, that the twins, Sam and Eric, have failed to keep the fire alight. So the boys have let out the signal fire. They have failed. It reduces their chance of being saved and makes the disasters of the rest of the narrative seem inevitable. Okay, so we're moving into our track and trace activity, and we're going to start with this one. Then the sleeping leviathan breathed out, the waters rose, the weeds streamed, and the water boiled over the table rock with a, war, with a roar. So we're just going to start with this image of the sleeping leviathan, this metaphor um, used to define the ocean and the water in the island as a whole. So the leviathan is a biblical monster, um, and that's a monster that became later associated with the giant whales and sea monsters. There is a threat that can't be defeated by humans. There is, therefore, symbolically here, and a reflection the monstrousness that humanity is capable of. The fact that it's sleeping again reflects the way in which the boys, this verb, reflects the boys have not yet awoken to their own destructive potential but equally by the same token um, as we see the waters rise they boil over with a roar so just a final idea to add here is we see the way in which the ocean still consumes 
that destruction can consume everything. And we've seen that with the fire earlier in the novel as well. Now, the theme, the question that I'm looking at here is to what extent, um, you know, uh, are the is the island are the island the boys sort of barbaric so that's how we're going that's where we're going to push on there we have that with that word leviathan boiling and roaring so we can follow this through to what extent and how important is are the are these questions of the boys becoming barbaric so if we go back in the novel to the chapter from paint uh, from uh, painted faces and long hair we can think about this ritual okay where they pretend to kill so we have them circling pretending they dance they sing um so we have the celebration of violence and the rehearsal of violence these acts are barbaric in nature but they also lead to the death of Simon later because Simon is killed within one of these ceremonies when he is mistaken for the beast. And that's the same idea that I'm going to follow through to here because we have the same ritual, the same dancing and singing, kill the pig, cut a throat, bash her in, those harsh verbs, kill, cut and bash. But Golding gives us this image of Simon afterwards. Even in the rain, they could see how small a beast it was, and already it was its blood was staining the sand. So we have the smallness of Simon and the blood staining the sand. Um, and on top of that, we also have these uh, sibilant S's. Even in the rain, they could see how small a beast it was, and already its blood was staining the sand. So this sibilance is a quiet, insistent sound. The violence is over. It's as though the body of Simon has been exhausted of life, but perhaps also gets across the shock the consequences of this violence and then coming back into the main quotation that verb here staining that barbarism brutality and violence leave permanent marks on the boys um, and finally, the smallness of the body, that adjective, smallness, the vulnerability, the lack of safety, making Simon this almost inevitably targeted figure by this stage of the novel. So you need to follow our big questions up across these chains, looking closely at each quotation, analysing them closely, identifying your literary devices like simile, metaphor, personification, as well as our language devices like the verb choices, for instance, and exploring that range of meaning that's produced at each stage. And we'll just now look and bring all this together with our big questions, the big questions that we want to be thinking about and answering as we uh, complete our study of this chapter. OK, so the first of our big questions, how is the island being used by Golden as a symbolic framework? Well, we know it reflects the boys' own movement to violence, that perhaps the natural world, even if even if damaged and harmed, still has massive power, that the natural world 
can produce and repeat the violence of humanity. And in that sense, then, the world of the island appeared idyllic, so a perfect place, and Edenic, so like the Garden of Eden. But actually, we have revealed the way in which the world as a whole that the world as a whole is inherently threatening and terrifying. Now there's lots that this novel says about leadership and this is an idea that I wanted to introduce in this video that we were going to come back to again and again and again. But we have Ralph resist the space for a fort and he identifies that it is a rotten place. There's something wrong with it. There's something disgusting about it. There's something diabolical about it. Um, we have a moment of Ralph and Jack together. But realistically, their opposition is sustained. And it's a failure of leadership that sees the boys on the island divide and fall increasingly to violence. And in terms of leadership, we also see that the twins, Sam and Eric, allow the signal fire to go out. That, they f that the boys, and Ralph in particular, failed to see that Sam and Eric couldn't complete this task. And this leaves them even more vulnerable. And finally, to what extent is the world as a whole and in this novel increasingly barbaric? So this word should remind us of the savagery that we've talked about, the increasing darkness, the brutality. But actually, as the novel is progressing, we are moving from Edenic imagery to threatening and harmful images that humans and the natural world are painted in increasingly terrifying terms. And we can think about also with this barbarism, this savagery, this brutality, the rituals move from civility and innocence to violence and brutality. That increasingly the rituals on the island allow for the rehearsal of violence and barbarism rather than civility and democracy.